Welcome everyone to the 2023 global, in progress. global Animal Disaster Management Conference brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Before we start, we have a few basic housekeeping items. We want to bring to your attention an important update regarding the conference schedule. There was an error with the Australian Times for the New York sessions, F and H, in, on the initial schedule. Please visit our website at www.gadmc.org for the updated and corrected schedule. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature and we will endeavor to answer these at the end of the presentation. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captioning. So if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, please click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag GADM C-O-N-F in all your social media posts to help us spread the word about the conference. A short evaluation will be made available when you exit the session. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help shape the next GADMAC conference. Finally, a reminder that the video recording of this and all other presentations will be available later this year after it has been properly edited. It is our great privilege to have Azadine Downs, the president and CEO of GADMAX gold sponsor organization, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, IFA, as our keynote speaker. We will begin with his thoughts on meeting conflict with compassion, then visit with Shannon Walitis, IFA's Director of Disaster Response and Risk Reduction after the video. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Azadine Downs and I'm the President and CEO of the International Fund for Animal Welfare, also known as IFA. I'd like to start off by thanking Animal Evac New Zealand for inviting me to speak and for its deep rooted commitment to creating resilient animal inclusive communities. I would also like to take a moment to applaud you all for the efforts as leaders in disaster response. It's no surprise that our world is facing unprecedented challenges, from the ever escalating impact of climate change to what feels like a relentless onslaught of continuous environmental disasters that are wreaking havoc on our landscape and on our precious biodiversity. It's easy to feel overwhelmed, as though we have run out the clock and simply gone past the point of no return. Though I assure you, my friends, the collection of participants gathered today is a testament to the determination to make a difference, to safeguard the world's animals and habitats in times of crisis and beyond, a front line of defense in a world that shows no sign of changing, unless humanity chooses to change itself first. Friends, our future depends in part on the actions that we take today, the processes that we develop, the best practices we share, the plans we create in anticipation of and in response to the environmental disasters that will no doubt continue to affect human society and the world's animals. I firmly believe we are all called upon to be stewards of nature, both in times of crisis and in times of peace. And it's this commitment to stewardship that continues to give me tremendous hope, despite the challenges we face today. Thank you for being called to serve as these agents of change and for being the masons of the building blocks created a better future for both people and animals. Now, I'd like to briefly share a few words about this organization to which I have dedicated much of my life for the past 25 years. IFA is a global nonprofit with operations in more than 40 countries across the globe, helping both animals and people thrive together. We rescue, rehabilitate and release animals whilst also working to restore and protect their natural habitats. We believe intrinsically that every individual matters. I suspect that our philosophies are closely aligned on that point and so many others. And we demonstrate this through our work, both in the field and behind closed doors from the local community, all the way up to the global one. 
For over half a century, our organization has been in the business of saving lives. And we have done this through collaboration, compassion, community engagement, and perhaps most importantly, through understanding the deep interconnectedness between humans and animals. IFA's disaster response team knows this perhaps all too well. Deploying to the areas hit hardest by natural disasters, war and conflict, the team works endlessly to rescue animals from the aftermath of disasters and re reunite them with their families. Whether those families are human or wildlife, like you, we promise to leave no animal behind. We understand the very real connection that exists between humans and animals and how reuniting those families represents such an important return to normalcy, a deliverance of hope in the most trying of times. As a leader of an organization recognized for its disaster response work, I am often asked the following questions by both critics and supporters alike. Why does IFA devote vital resources to animals affected by conflicts when there is so much human suffering? It's a valid question and perhaps one of the most important questions that I'm regularly asked. And, I, and friends, let me tell you, it is one that I am eager to answer. I always begin with a response with a quick validator. At IFA, we believe that in times of conflict, it is vital to address human needs first. War and natural disasters create uninhabitable conditions marked by immense destruction, suffering, and despair. We always ensure that human needs are addressed first and foremost before sending our disaster response team on the ground to assist with animal rescue. Now, here's the part of my answer that most often intrigues people. I fall wholeheartedly believes in rescuing animals from disasters, regardless of the origins of that disaster because of the simple fact that the welfare of animals is intrinsically linked to the welfare of humans. When we rescue animals from disaster and when we protect wildlife during times of conflict, we are helping multiple species thrive, including our own. Let me explain further. Animals and human, as well as our fates, are deeply intertwined. The animal kingdom is wondrously powerful, yet immensely fragile, much like humanity itself for we are one and the same. We always have been, and there's no indication that this will ever change. This remains true during all periods of life, whether we're experiencing peace or ex experiencing conflict. We must, however, firmly remind ourselves that human conflict is never confined to human society alone. It spills over into all aspects of the natural environment and its inhabitants, impacting everything in its path. With no way of escaping the violence and suffering caused either directly or indirectly by human beings, animals are uniquely caught in the crossfire, whether due to wildfires in California, brush fires in Queensland, or the series of massive earthquakes which took nearly all of Syria and Turkey. There will always be people concerned about the safety and well-being of their animals. I have no doubt you've seen this firsthand as well. Individuals tightly clutch their pets, eager of any types of assistance to help their furry, scaled, and even feathered family members. Some even risk their own lives in the face of danger, refusing to evacuate until they can be reassured that their animals will also be kept safe. This underscores the powerful bond existing between people and animals, and these are made more apparent during these times of crisis. The lives of such companion animals are so closely intertwined with our own but let's remember, it's not just pets who suffer during these times of crisis. Wild animals do too. Perhaps the greatest difference of all, wild animals have no direct recourse to turn to during such times. No formal systems, processes, confidants. Simply the hope that nature itself will rebalance itself, will heal itself and undo the damage, or that its human inhabitants will eventually step in and make things right. Here's an interesting fact. Researchers analyzed decades of wildlife population trends across Africa and were able to determine the single most important predictor of whether species prosper or perish. The answer might surprise you. It isn't poaching or habitat loss or even climate change. The answer is human conflict. Societal and geopolitical conflicts have produced both short and long-term consequences that reverberate for wildlife as well as the delicate natural balance of the environment as a whole. The impact of war can be observed in many ways, including habitat destruction, degradation of food and water sources, even noise pollution. 
Changes in the environment brought about by conflict affect each individual animal, family, community, as well as entire species. Often, these repercussions last for generations. The connection between people and wildlife becomes even more apparent during the chaos of conflict. The proliferation of weapons and the impact of organized groups hardened by combat put wildlife populations under extreme pressure during and after a time of conflict. And sadly enough, nearly 80% of modern conflicts take place in biodiversity hotspots, spots where growing threats like food insecurity, habitat loss, and climate change continue to profoundly impact both people and wildlife. Conflict leads to a breakdown in environmental protection. It leads to a decline in police enforcement of wildlife protection. And as a result, we see an escalation in negative consequences that range anywhere from poaching to an increase in illegal wildlife trade in areas in crisis. This is particularly evident in communities where wildlife-based tourism plays an important economic role. People in war-torn regions often rely on wildlife for food and for some form of financial security. But when resources are limited, tensions and conflicts inevitably rise. Competition over resources, food, water, shelter, creates a cycle of prolonged war and suffering. Impacts not just for humans, but the natural world itself. It's imperative that we end the conflict that affects us as humans because we know with full certainty that the conflict is affecting the animals and wildlife which surround us. Reinforcing our own peace reinforces theirs. If we choose to have an impact, then let it be the right form of impact an impact where we re-establish a sense of harmony. Friends, society is conditioned to accept that conflicts such as war and civil unrest will undoubtedly result in human harm. It is not, however, accustomed to thinking about the suffering that such wars and unrest cause to animals. Casualties are often measured in human lives with rarely a mention of the overwhelming effects on animals the natural environment and biodiversity that comes from human-driven conflicts. You see this time and time again in the field, both within times of conflict and times of peace, from companion animals to livestock to surrounding local wildlife. Animals form an integral part of our ability to thrive as human beings. And as a whole, we must recognize the profound impact of conflict upon animals as a fundamental first step towards restoring our own humanity. When we alleviate the suffering of animals, whether companion or wild, we help return a sense of normalcy to people per persevering through conflict. Efforts to rescue animals both affirm and amplify compassion in times when it is needed most. Sympathy and compassion, devoid of any political agenda. Helping animals in distress during times of conflict gives us hope. It reinforces what it means to be distinctly human, to extend a gentle hand of compassion, allowing us to fulfill the need to protect those who are most vulnerable. I cannot think of a more relevant example than the current war in Ukraine. Initial month of conflict, IFA managed the only service tent at the border crossing in Poland, welcoming thousands of refugees daily, supplying them with pet food, carriers, medicine, and emergency veterinary care. Our team met people from all walks of life who had endured the unimaginable we met Elena, a courageous woman who escaped with her mother and three cats. We met Victoria and her daughter, Sofia, who were traveling with three dogs, one of who was days away from labor. We even met a family whose brave child safely transported his beloved hamster hundreds of miles in his pocket. It is these moments that our work becomes far more than just supporting animals. I thought simply blue tent became a symbol of hope for so many, for us as well. I revert back to the phrase that we use often at IFAL. That phrase is, every individual animal matters, an integral part of our identity, a principle that we carry with us in all aspects of our work. This belief remains true of, across all efforts in the globe. A pet trapped in the path of a fire, a milking cow displaced by an earthquake, or a wild rhino stranded by floods. We are accomplishing far more than just saving the life of that single animal. We are reuniting a family. We are restoring a community's livelihood, rebuilding normalcy to either a human construct. We are taking one more step to saving a species potentially on the brink of extinction. And we are fulfilling our role as stewards of the natural world. 
there is likely no group assembled today better able to recognize the dangerous trends and repercussions occurring in the field of disaster management, specifically when it comes to animals. From species decimation to habitat fragmentation to ravaging the natural processes that have taken millennia and even longer to, to perfect, there is no shortage of impact. What we must decide is whether we will accept these consequences as a foregone conclusion or whether we will strive to reverse the situation and restore balance. I implore you to continue to work together and recognize these trends, devising solutions to the threats facing so many communities today. Sometimes those solutions will be based on technology and improved regional mapping, or sometimes they will be the outcome of improved comprehensive emergency planning efforts. But make no mistake about it, regardless of which solution is ultimately employed, its effectiveness will be driven by you. It will be born from your efforts, your sense of compassion, your determination to have an impact on the environment around you and the species which make up our shared planet or as we say here at IFA, our shared home. It will be driven by your desire to make things right, to give nature the time and tools and space necessary to begin doing what it does best, bounce back. Because if there's something we've learned time and again, both in disaster response and as a result of the global pandemic, nature will bounce back if we allow it to. I encourage you to continue being stewards of the natural world continue to be an example for us all. May your proactivity always overwhelm the reactivity that too often describes the rest of society's response to disasters. May you stand firm at the first line of defense against the changes too often inflicted upon the natural world and its beloved animals. May you continue to be instruments for building animal inclusive, resilient communities that truly and fundamentally embrace nature rather than imposing a misguided sense of dominion over it. Thus, in closing, I'd like to emphasize that I firmly believe that those organizations like yours and IFA are bestowed with the inherent trust of an entire community, regardless of ecological impact, physical proximity, or even strategic importance. Our respective organizations exist because there is an underlying faith that you and I will act. You will make the situation right and alleviate the suffering of so many people and animals and help restore balance to their natural environments. Continue this noble work, the work of impact where empathy represents a critical strength, not a weakness. I commend you and applaud you and offer my sincerest thanks to all of you. You have refused to turn your backs on the animals that make up our shared planet and have saved a critical part of humanity in the process. Thank you again. Thank you, Azadine. And thank you all for joining us this evening for me and in the morning for many of you. My name is Shannon Walitis. I am the Director of Disaster Response for Risk Redu and Risk Reduction at the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Sorry about that. Uh, and I wanted to just follow up Azadine's session there with uh, kind of tying his message of meeting conflict with compassion to us as professionals, because we are, as he said, we are those who act, we are those who have accepted the responsibility to intervene when animals, people, and communities are in crisis. So I just wanted to tie his session into what we all do as professionals and say that um, looking back almost 13 years ago, Dick Green hired me at IFA, and he was very, very clear, uh, as many of you can imagine, he was very clear that animal rescue as a profession had earned the seat at the proverbial planning table for disaster management through very hard work. We earned that seat at the table through raising our standards of training, our best practices, and showing respect for those that we serve. We owe it to our teams, our partners, our communities, and ourselves to continue to raise that bar, to raise the standard that we're all going to, to do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. 
And I also wanted to, to just bring up the fact that it is without a doubt that all of us face threats from many different angles all the time, many different directions. Not one single organization or agency or individual can do the work that needs to be done by themselves. So together, we can. And I really would like you all to commit, to recommit for some of us, recommit to keeping that seat at the table. One voice, one mission, and one purpose. I thank Mr. Downs again for his time tonight. And we wanted to leave a little space for questions and answers. And uh, I'll open up the floor. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, Mr. Downs mentioned IFA's work in the Ukraine. Would you be able to expand upon that? Um, throughout the conference this year, we've been keen to include consideration of public policy and legal aspects. So if you might have an opportunity to share a little bit about what you, um, what IFA encountered when they were over in the Ukraine in those aspects. So perhaps, you know, what policies were in place for caring for the animals? Sure, I think that's a, a great point to make. When we, when we found out as, as an organization that the invasion of Ukraine was imminent from our local partners in Eastern Ukraine, we spent several days prior to the invasion helping them to build caches of supplies to try and get funding into them uh, while banks were still open and making sure that we were providing any guidance that we could for this, what could be catastrophic event. We had experience working with them in 2004 14 and 15. So we had a little bit of an idea um, uh, of what their state of readiness looked like and how we could potentially build up the support that they would have for the foreseeable future. And once the invasion started in February, once it, once it started, um, at that time, we had already been reaching out not only to those partners in Eastern Ukraine, but to every veterinary authority in Ukraine, but also in surrounding uh, the neighboring countries. And so trying to present them with solutions of what we anticipated they may be faced with. And that involved um, a game plan, kind of a, a, a basically a, a model of how to be prepared the best they could in the days ahead to receive refugees coming out of Ukraine with or without animals. We didn't know at the time uh, that the EU commission would recommend to all EU member states that they waive the pet entry requirements. Never been done, never heard about it, even thinking about it. And when that happened, we were very well aware that there could potentially be millions of people, literally millions of people that would not have left Ukraine had they not had the, the um, entry requirements waived for their pets. Millions of lives could have potentially been saved. And so when you mention policy, it's really important that I bring up that we, one of our uh, five displaced Ukrainians that we've, we've created a Ukraine project team working from within Ukraine, one of them is full time working on advocacy. She is tasked with reaching out through EU member states and within Ukraine to, to engage displaced Ukrainians that moved to the Western side of the country to try and collect data. Because those of us on, on this at this conference realize that data collection and analysis is something that our profession is still behind. We're still behind on that. And until we're able to collect that data and be able to present the facts of how many lives were saved. Um, we're, we're gonna keep struggling to request additional funding for preparedness, for response, for recovery. 
And so in the case of the Ukraine war, we do have that person is full time working on collecting that data to try to not only show the impact of that EU Commission's decision to recommend that these states allow pets to come across, but also the consequences of that decision too, Ginny, because now we have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of animals that have crossed the border with a lack of vaccination, a lack of records, and trying to keep up with where they went and potentially, you know, unchecked by a vet wherever they they landed, God forbid, I mean, they all were looking for a new home. Um, and realizing that, that a majority of the Ukrainians that we interacted with and still continue to interact with, if they left Ukraine, they want to go home. So why, why take their pet to a vet there when they, they're, they're, they all believe that they're going home soon and they're going to go right back to Ukraine? So what we have committed to with our team on the ground in Ukraine and neighboring countries is building the level of animal welfare standards so that when they do go home, they're going to they're going to be walking into an, an environment that yes, is ravaged by war, but we are doing what we can, where we can throughout the country to raise those animal welfare standards, working with local vets, local organizations that continue to save lives. So the policy piece is critical because not only are we going to be um, looking at the impact, collecting data to be able to support new legislation to demand that animals are included in disaster planning throughout the EU. We're also going to demand with facts that the consequences of not then supplementing any actions that EU member states take to receive animals from across the border of any border will re also receive financial support to care and control those animals. So it's not just a matter of opening up, literally, I hate to use the phrase with this group, the floodgates, but now that we are all dealing with the repercussions of almost 8 million refugees leaving Ukraine, another seven displaced internally within the country. How are we going to keep caring for them if we don't know where they are, how many, what they need, and documenting what we're finding, how we're helping, and what are those unmet needs? And can we put that into legislation to not only protect Ukrainians, people in the neighboring EU countries, but globally as well. That is absolutely necessary because as we're discovering disasters are making our world smaller and mm. today it is Ukraine, <clears throat> tomorrow where, where may it be? And right. creating a model to have those policies in place for the future will benefit everyone. That's so right. let's see if we have any questions. Um, not yet. So were you, you said you worked with partner organizations over there. Um, did you, were you able to go to Ukraine? I personally was not able to go to Ukraine for safety and security reasons. So I was on the border with uh, Poland for okay. three months. So I was on the on that border, but we did have several displaced Ukrainians that evacuated uh, professionals within our field, veterinary field, and also translators that we brought into our team. And so we had several team members that would go back and forth. And then of course, our Ukraine project team that is all Ukrainian um, and will is, is based there and will continue to, to work there. So uh, yeah, that's, um, that's where I was. Okay. What, um, Jenny, Jenny, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I, th I think Gerardo has a question, um, but because he's, um, in there, it's this area, he can't ask it, um, directly. Absolutely, um, let me come scroll back and find that. Um, 
I can't, could... I can't type. I cannot type it. I'm sorry. I don't know why. Well, you're welcome to join us and ask us, Gerardo. Thank you. Uh, I just was really curious to uh, explore what uh, what the thoughts are on how Ukraine could uh, join the EU if they need to uh, change any animal welfare legislation they might have. Thanks. That's a great point. And uh, Gerardo, I, I fear that the animal welfare standards that the, um, that the EU would require are quite minimal. I feel like that is not, um, that is not going to be something that holds up any um, opportunity that Ukraine has to, to join them. However, I feel like this is, I hate to say the chance of a lifetime for all of us in our profession to help them and support them to raise those standards while I hate to say the attention is on them, while the microscope is still on them, and to make sure that we keep that attention. And um, the, the, the way that we are able to continue to garner support for our Ukraine project team is because of that human animal bond, not only with companion animals, but with community animals, so livestock, and, uh, and other large uh, animals, but also wild animals and the habitats they've lost. So we're able to pull in, as you know from your experience, the more ministries you get involved, the more you know, microscopes you start turning on other ministries to say, hey, this is, this is um, we really need to have a more holistic approach. We don't want to be that animal group that just wah, wah, wah. We actually want to bring, to convene those ministries of power, those lawmakers, those policymakers, decision makers, and bring them together with the human rescue, the human services side of, of the house and be able to say, here is a holistic solution to increase the, the human welfare aspect of the new Ukraine, but also um, recognizing that you can't do that without recognizing the importance of animals in their lives, every species, and um, for for whatever reason, I've, I've honest to God traveled all around the world, but the 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 care of these animals and the attention to to their safety, putting their lives ahead of their own, um, people love animals. People in Ukraine love their animals, and we have to help them get the support from, from those policymakers and decision makers about how they rebuild together. Thank you, Shannon. Gerardo, did you have anything to follow up with that? No, no, I was just listening um, carefully. Thanks. When yeah, I do, I, I do wish that the UN would have um, some stricter um, guidelines for for animal well and welfare, animal care and control, I think it is an important aspect um, that we could potentially um, encourage them to, to raise those standards. Thanks. Thank you. If we have no other questions from anyone, then we will thank you, Shannon, so much for your time and Mr. Downs for his time to introduce us to IFA and the wonderful work you're doing. And just a reminder, GADMAC is made free to view and access thanks to the generosity of our sponsors, including IFA and donors. To keep GADMAC free for all, we invite you to donate via our website at www.gadmc.org.